Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, and welcome to the Sir Charles Wilson Building and our third Dalrymple Lecture to be given by Professor Gavin Lucas of the University of Iceland. I'm Colleen Beatty, Senior Lecturer in Viking Archaeology in Glasgow, and it's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker to you this evening. Before I do so, however, I need to make you aware of the emergency exits. A few housekeeping notes here. The emergency exits in this building in the very unlikely event that we have an outbreak of fire. The two exits at the front, you know how it goes, two here, one at the back, um, enable egress uh, from this room to the main entrance. And you should gather beyond the main entrance um, on, on the pavement side there. If we, need, if we are required to do so. And also just to note that the lecture is being filmed, but that not the questions that follow. So no one need in any way feel inhibited to speak. We welcome you all to partake of this joyous occasion. Our speaker has already presented two thought-provoking and energizing lectures on the subject of the archeology span of time. We've heard about the archeological clock as well as changing times which have introduced the notion of time in its many forms, commonly applied to the archaeological record. For example, we heard yesterday about the quest and the challenges for precision dating of an event in the Paleolithic era at Boxgrove in Sussex, events which took place some half a million years ago, but the reality is that the event itself may well have only taken moments or minutes actually to take place. But the action itself was built on a lifetime of experience, presumably, of the Flint Napper himself. This raises two notions. The first, that activities may seem to be, and indeed in, te in reality technically are, floating in time from our faraway viewpoint. The second notion is that the individual actor that was most certainly for him or her, most certainly an event fixed in time. In an overarching view of time, in all its possible constructs, the role of the individual is crucial. For that person, time is measured in so very many ways, be it the hunting cycle, the life cycle, just to name a couple. Time can sometimes appear as slow to an individual, as before a major accident, when things are often described as being in slow motion. Equally, during the build-up to a happy event, the are we nearly there syndrome, I'll call that one. But time can also seem to pass far too quickly, and if we're enjoying ourselves. So how can we quantify time at this remove? It does depend on the individual circumstance. For the individual, the marking of time can be assessed through unexpected aspects. The growth of children, the amount of time it might have been since friends spent time together, or the realisation that actually I may almost have taught Gavin as an undergraduate at University College London in the late 1980s. These time markers are salutary, but nonetheless real and certainly, unfortunately, very measurable. So Gavin comes to us from Iceland, the home of one of the most significant studies of determining time and its passing, the study of tephrochronology, where isochronic horizons of volcanic ash provide physical barriers, but crucially, chronological linkages. One of Mother Nature's ways of marking time, you might say. But in terms of immediate comprehension of time in all its guises, the human personal experience is a more understandable yardstick. I've known Gavin for almost 20 years. We worked together at Hofstadir in Northern Iceland on an amazing Viking site, whose main dwelling had a fourth floor space which was so readily intelligible, one could see where the wooden door scraped up the opening, the impressions from small stools on spindly wooden legs, and the repair of iron knives taking place around the fireplace, all actions caught in time from the Viking age. To see this resolution of everyday activities from the 10th century is indeed a moment I will never forget, a moment when time stood still, for sure. During our friendship, Gavin's family has grown. How can your eldest son possibly be 12? This is ridiculous. <laughs> Iceland has been a world leader 
both in volcanic eruptions and stock market crashes. And I've been in Glasgow with intermittent contact with his world. Time passes, but the fixed element is the human experience, battered and resilient on the whole, but most certainly not floating in time. The story is the same, whether you're talking about Boxgrove Man or indeed our Reykjavik Man. Gavin, it's such a pleasure to have you here in Glasgow to deliver the Dalrymple Lectures for 2019. We look forward very much to learning how, not to learning now of contemporary pasts, and I hope that now you find your hour seems to expand, although for your audience that same hour will undoubtedly fly by. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you very much, Colleen. Wow. I don't know how to top that. <laughs> but I'm going to try. Um, so, last night, for those of you who are here, I, I discussed um, um, the issues of a relative chronology and issues of phasing and periodization. I talked about phasing my site. I talked about large-scale phasing and, and periodizations and issues of, uh, of sequence. And one of the things that... Uh, I tried to stress, I suppose, is, is how one of the benefits of, of thinking about uh, relative chronology is, is that they deal with this question of change uh, because they're very much keyed into the events that we're actually looking and studying. And one of the dominant ways, of course, in which we think about periodization and phasing is in terms of this process of change, phase A following phase B and phase C and so on, or period A, B, B C, whatever. Um, and it's very easy to think that periodization and phasing is therefore all about change. It's about marking change. But tonight, I want to switch and our focus to think about this notion of phasing and periodization from a different perspective. Because although phases and periods do are used to mark change in the historical record or the archaeological record, there's another aspect to periods and phases which we shouldn't forget. And that is, a period or a phase is, is thought of in some way as a set of uh, contemporary features, things which define a particular period or define an epoch or an era. Uh, you have this notion of zeitgeist, for example, this sense of a, of a spirit of an age. So that whole notion that a phase also has a coherence as a whole, it isn't just something which is distinguished from what came before and what came after. It also contains this notion of, of, of a set of things which belong together that are contemporary. And it's that aspect that I want to spend, my, uh, spend this evening focusing on. Um, now, relative chronologies, as I mentioned in my very first lecture, deal only with sequence, not duration. So we have no way of knowing how long a certain period or phase lasted, um, only that it comes before or after another period. So as a result, they, really, they work through this notion of embodying change. But one of the things I, I want to ask also is how does this practically achieved? And I, I'd suggest that archaeology is typically drawn on two methods for constructing relative chronologies or sequences. Now, the standard method and the method that I was taught uh, as a student, and this is the kind of textbook view in which we understand um, relative chronology, is through stratigraphy. And I'm think, think, thinking particularly in terms of, again, field work and working on a site and how you construct the relative sequence of events on a site. Um, you're basically using stratigraphy, stratigraphic layers, uh, and inferring spatial relations of contiguity and superposition and interpreting time through that. Now, that's fine, but the trouble is, um, and this works, of course, very well in Iceland because we work with very, very well stratified sites, but my experience before Iceland, particularly in, uh, in, in commercial and contract archaeology in the east of England, um, was very, very different. There, I encountered very different types of sites, and the methods that I was taught, particularly learning about the Harris Matrix and all the stratigraphy, suddenly when I met a site like this, which is kind of typical of a lot of rural excavations, plow zone sites, where most of the, the stratigraphy has been plowed away. Um, stratigraphy isn't always very useful. Of course, you've got some, some stratigraphy, got intercutting ditches, some pits cutting others, and you can use these. But there's a large part of these features and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, deposits which you encounter on these sites don't have any stratigraphic relations to each other at all. So how on earth do you start to build sequence there? And it's this other, other method, which is 
often sidelined and not given in your model solutions when you're a student, but really is actually a large part of what you have to do to generate sequence is what I want to focus on. It's often called misleadingly horizontal stratigraphy, but, but what's really going on is, is really thinking about the features on a site like this in terms of their morphology and looking for morphological similarities, looking at things like the, the nature of the deposits and the fills and the ditches, are they similar to each other? Looking particularly at things like spatial alignments of ditches, how they line up or how postals cohere together. So what you're thinking is in terms of morphological similarity. You're using a completely different set of tools than stratigraphy. They don't teach you, or they didn't teach me these kind of tools when I was studying archaeology. They taught you stratigraphy, and they thought that will solve all your problems. But it really doesn't work on a lot of sites like this. And so my experience is what you, you kind of learn on, on the job about all these other techniques which are, are less codified in archaeology. Um, and once you have this, you essentially uh, try and build up a sense of a set of features which are contemporary. So two ditches that run along the same line, you think, okay, maybe they are contemporary, and then you can maybe test that by looking at the artifacts that are coming out of them. Or you look at a series of postals and join the dots and find structures or find relations and things. So what you're doing, first and foremost, is building sequence, not building sequence, but establishing relations of contemporaneity based on similarity. Uh, and then from that, you then infer sequence afterwards by drawing on other, other bits of information. Now, morphological similarity as a technique for defining contemporaneity is, of course, only useful in terms of very broad blocks of time. And, and as I said, to order these blocks of time, you need to draw on these other, other, other techniques, looking at the artifacts in the, in associated with them, or if you've got C14 dates or whatever, to bring this sequence in. But I think this, this kind of method of relative chronology, which, which kind of prioritizes contemporaneity, or thinking about contemporaneity first and building sequence on after that, is, is, a, is a really dominant part of what we do, even if it's not kind of so, much, so well codified as, as stratigraphy. Um, and it's actually a large part of what we do also in artifact studies. I mean, just think about how you identify assemblages of pottery as being contemporary based on their, on their morphological similarity, their typological similarity. Or, or just think about building analysis or art historical work. And there's the connection here with archaeology, of course, is quite strong. How do you recognize this, this element of architecture as Romanesque and that as Gothic? It's not based on some stratigraphic relationship. It's based on a sense of what the Romanesque means, what the Gothic means, what, these, what kind of features define this. And the same with anything, with Neolithic pottery or Romano-British pottery. You're kind of basing it on a sense of a set of attributes or features which, which go together and seem to cohere and belong to a certain time period, a certain uh, yeah, period of time. So if we think about, for example, how the three-age system uh, was originally um, devised, it was largely a relative chronology based on marking change in, in cutting tool technology from stone to bronze to iron and so on. And the direction of this sequence was, of course, not guessed at, even if it was informed by older ideologies of technological progress and so on. It was ultimately ratified by the method of fine combination and these stratigraphic relationships. But if we think about what the Neolithic means Today, it's a much more polymorphous entity. The Neolithic is perhaps not so much defined in opposition to uh, the Bronze Age or the Iron Age or the Mesolithic or whatever. It's equally defined by a set of characteristics which define what, what the Neolithic is. We think about things like domestication, um, monumental architecture, pottery, sedentism, and so on. But significantly, none of these features exclusively define it, of course. Its boundaries are shady. Indeed, the emphasis on period transitions that have occupied a lot of archaeologists now for the past few decades underlines this, this shadiness. But what it points to, I think, is a subtle shift from thinking about a period like the Neolithic in terms of its edges and its distinction from preceding and later periods and more in terms of its center. What is it that holds it together as a recognizable phenomenon? Or perhaps it's more accurate to say this tension defining a period from its edges versus its center just becomes much more acute than it was maybe 150 years ago. Now, this, this alternative definition of a period by defining it in terms of its center is, really reminds me of uh, 
the historian philosopher Collingwood's forgotten or often marginalized view of periods as being defined by their epicenter. This is from a paper he wrote in, in 1927. And most historians, when you read historians on periodization, they tend to stress the function of periodization as marking change. But what Collingwood suggested is that to understand a period, one needs to do it from the inside out, not from its edges, not from its distinction from other periods. So it was more about the unity of what holds a period together, its coherence. And this is also about defining the meaning of what makes objects or events contemporary. So contemporaneity is not simply a temporal property, but also, in a sense, an ontological one in the relationship to the objects and their relationships to each other. Contemporaneity ultimately implies a connection. So when on two different settlements, people stop using one type of ceramics and start using another, this isn't through some magical connection, of course. It's because they're connected in some way, in some real concrete way. And, and, and if we think about this in a, in a global level, um, and I'm thinking, again, of, uh, of historians who've discussed this issue of global periodizations, they've stressed this point in the sense that to talk about a global periodization presupposes talking about the world as in, interconnected. You know, how can, of course, can we use the, the same periodization in Europe and North America in prehistory if there's no connection between them, if their histories are not entangled in some way? Um, maybe there's only, the only scope for a global periodization is something that's really only emerged as the, as, as, as the Earth has become more and more in, interconnected in the different uh, cultures around the world. But, of course, even this is problematic, and this is something that I'd raised in my talk last night about, re, about global regional uh, relative chronologies and some of the dangers inherent in that. But it does seem to me uh, that although relative chronologies such as periodizations mark change, this is only insofar as we do view them as chronologies, as a sequence of events. But most rel relative chronologies, as I mentioned, don't just create sequence. They also create this notion of contemporaneity. And although, again, this tends to get marginalized as temporal property, in favor of sequence. It is this, this, this aspect that I want to focus on tonight and try and unpack it a little bit more. So I want to start with a, with a really basic question. What is contemporaneity? What do we mean when we say that two sites or two features or even two artifacts are contemporary? Now, the obvious answer or the immediate answer, perhaps, is that they occur or belong to the same time. And, and this is, in fact, how the Oxford English Dictionary defines it. But immediate problem emerges, I think, because what could the same time mean? What do we mean by the same time? I spent a lot of my first lecture um, discussing the idea of, of a singular time, the use of an absolute chronology as being underwritten by a singularization of time so that all history, human and non-human even, can be brought together within a, a, simple, a single temporal register. And in that sense, everything belongs to the same time. But that's clearly not what we're talking about when we're talking about things being contemporary. Surely, perhaps, we're meaning uh, some kind of a temporal alignment within this segment, so that within any segment of time, two things both happen within the same segment, they're contemporary. So two events occurring in the year 1786 or 2019, for that matter, we could say are contemporary. But then, perhaps this isn't right either. Because the problem is absolute chronology is scalable. That's one of the things I was trying to emphasize a lot, both on my first lecture and to some extent last night as well. Because we can scale our units up, so the concept of contemporaneity should also, by implication, be scalable too. So two events that occur in the 18th century are contemporary. But what if one occurred in 1712 and the other in 1786? They're both in the 18th century. Are they still contemporary? You know, but two events in the same millennium by that logic are also contemporary. So this is, well, something's going wrong here. Certainly no historian would accept this, and perhaps even archaeologists wouldn't either, although actually we often do. We're quite happy if we can date two objects to within the same century, and we often call them contemporary. But really, what, what do we mean when we're saying two things are contemporary just because they happen to belong to the same century? What's really being, being, being said there? So... I think we have to really be careful what we're talking about here when we're talking about contemporaneity. And it certainly seems as if our standards of what counts as contemporary shifts according to the context, both, of course, of our dating resolution and, and, and the resolution of the archaeological record. Um, 
but most critically according to the objects or events which are being compared. So let's think this through a little bit more. I think we might be very happy to say that two settlements are contemporary if they can both be placed within a span of, say, a century or two, but might be less happy to say that about artifacts. And this is perhaps just because of some inbuilt presumption that settlements last longer. So if a settlement can span over 100 years or 200 years, it's fine to say that they're contemporary if, if we can bring that within one century, whereas artifacts tend to have shorter use lives. But of course, you can't even generalize. Some settlements are very short-lived, whereas some artifacts live longer. But the point really is not so much to kind of grade things like this. It's more to recognize that contemporaneity is really a product or a relationship between objects, not between objects and time or a segment of time. Okay, that's the critical point I want to stress here, or at least my, my feeling is understanding contemporaneity is that we've got to always think of it as a relationship, a temporal relationship between objects, not a relationship between objects and a block of time. And this, in a sense, also brings me back to a point I made in last night's lecture about the importance of not conflating the units of measure, our chronology, with that which is being measured, the events or objects in question. Contemporaneity relates to our units of, uh, uh, not to our units of measurement, but to the duration, or to the durational scales of those units, whatever they happen to be, years, centuries, millennia, but rather to the things which we're trying to measure or compare, the things under study. So two things are contemporary with each other, not with some abstract unit of time. And I think it's very important to analytically keep the two separate. Now, again, this distinction might seem obvious, but I think, again, we often just forget about it and conflate it and, and not really give it much serious thought that we slip into the language of talking about contemporaneity as if it was contemporary to a period of time rather than contemporary, contemporaneity being a relationship, a temporal relationship between objects. One of the problems with uh, conflating the unit of measure with that which is being measured is that it reduces also contemporaneity to this notion of synchrony, this idea that two events or objects might appear perfectly in step with, with each other because they both have been dated to the 17th century or even to the 1830s or whatever. So as such, two events are either contemporary or not. It's an either either or relationship, um, depending on whether they can be say on the same date, whatever date range you want to give that. But there are a lot of ways for objects to be contemporary rather than simply being synchronized. And here I want to bring up the work of um, James Allen, who works in, who's worked in uh, uh, artificial intelligence and developed what he called these time interval algorithms. And these have been taken up by archaeologists working in digital um, databases and, and, and so on to try and codify and structure these temporal relationships in a slightly more sophisticated way than we often do in archaeology. In archaeology, we often have this very simple set of relationships. There's before and after, and then there's contemporary. We have these three relationships. I mean, that, when you're learning the Harris Matrix or stratigraphy, these are your three temporal relationships. It's rather quite impoverished. And what's interesting about these algorithms is that they kind of express and uncover, actually, there's a lot more variability uh, that we could actually articulate in notions of contemporaneity. Um, so, for example, if we think about synchronicity, it's about two things stopping and starting at exactly the same time. But there's other forms of contemporaneity. There's overlapping. There's overlapping to a greater or lesser extent. There's things being contained within another period or things being uh, falling uh, w within or outside it and so on. So all these relationships that you can see up here, these are just uh, some of the standard measures of codifying it. And I'm not saying these are the only ones we can think about. These are also just kind of abstractions, but they help us explore and think about contemporaneity in a, in a slightly more um, sophisticated way and think about the other ways in which objects can be contemporary. Now, of course, in some ways, archaeologists have always been aware of this kind of multiplicity and exploited it to very good purpose. The basis of uh, many relative chronologies uses the idea of overlapping contemporaneity to build up longer sequences much longer than can often be gained by stratigraphy alone. The Scandinavian method of fine combination and the methods of seriation both exploit this feature. And these techniques were developed in the 19th and early 20th century, so they've been with us a very long time. But what these methods also do, in a sense, is offer us a different version of historical time, one that is not singular or segmented line, but a more like a braided rope of intertwining, overlapping threads of different length. And this is, there's a very different kind of multiplicity 
going on here. And again, I don't think it has anything to do with scale or, or, or scale of time. We can talk about this in very, very different ways. I want to explore and delve into this, this notion uh, in a little bit more depth now and use uh, as, a, as, a, as a way into that a paper by the French archaeologist Laurent Olivier uh, on uh, uh, a late Iron Age grave, the Hochdorf Princely grave. This is this a quite a well-known paper that he wrote in the late 90s. Some of you may have read it. Now, it, it addresses initially the problem of a chronological fault line in late Iron Age sequences in Central Europe specifically a disagreement between some of the traditional chronologies which were established through methods of cross-dating from imports in the Mediterranean, the kind of things that I mentioned in my first lecture that were established by Flinders Petrie, amongst others. Uh, so you've got that set of dates coming from, from that source on the one hand, and then another set of dates, new dates, coming through dendrochronology. And these things didn't tend to agree. The discrepancy was on the order of about 70 to 100 years. Now, you might not think that's a big deal, but in terms of the, the precision that some of these relative chronologies were offering, it was. Uh, how do you deal with this kind of discrepancy? And this was kind of uh, Olivia's starting point for his, for his paper, and his exploration into, into, into this, uh, this, this, uh, this one grave. Now, as I say, Olivia examined uh, the one grave in this sequence, the Hochdorf grave, from, which is from the Southwest Journey. It dates to around the second half of the 6th century um, BC. And to... He does it to illustrate what he says is the key problem here, the existence of multiple temporalities within a single event. Now, burials in archaeology uh, typically Im embed the ideal dating assemblage in many ways. They occur over a fairly short period of time, and once buried, they tend to remain buried and sealed and undisturbed. Of course, sometimes that doesn't happen, but often. They re represent what is often called a, a closed context or a closed find, and contrasts very sharply with some of the more open contexts and open finds you might see on settlement sites, uh, where basically you, you see the accumulation of multiple activities which kind of mix stuff together and stretch this period out, whereas a grave is often, often a, a very short period of time. Now, the Hochdorf grave is one of about 100 such graves, rich graves known, and characterized by a burial in a wooden chamber, like you can see in this reconstruction here from the museum. Um, uh, and it's covered by a mound. Accompanying the corpse in the chamber is typically a wagon or a chariot and items associated with drinking, grooming, and hunting. In the particular example Olivia looked at, he identified how the, uh, the so-called single event of the burial actually incorporates multiple different periods, and he, he brings out three different periods or three different temporalities in his, in his discussion. The first period is the time really dealing with the objects and the longevity and their time before their incorporation in the burial. Um, basically, the objects, in terms of what we might later have called object biographies, some of these objects which went into the grave are very old, even when the deceased had them and they've inherited them. And we, of course, we can all relate to this. I'm sure if you did an inventory of objects in your house uh, and found the oldest object you could find and the most recent, and think of the time gap that those two represent, uh, this is what we're talking about, in a sense. Objects don't cover and come from all different times and periods in the past. If I think of my house, I think one of the earliest objects I've got is a bit of late 17th century Chinese porcelain, and the most recent is perhaps some dinner, some food I bought from the supermarket the other night. So there's quite a, several centuries of, 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 of uh, time involved in the objects in, in my home, which exists now here in the present. And it's the same that really is going on here with this grave, and that's one of the key things that Olivia wants to emphasize here. The second aspect, or the second temporality that he focuses on is the, is the period of the actual interment of the grave itself, the bringing the objects into the grave. And he focuses here particularly on the modification that some of these objects have, have undergone. So in this particular example, some of the objects such as the shoes, the dagger, and the drinking horns have been gold-plated in a manner to render them very non-functional. Uh, and he argues, or the excavator argues, this was done as a post-mortem modification suggesting that this happened after the death of the person but before their burial in the grave. The third and final period refers to the time of the actual interment, the objects, the, burial, the putting into the grave, the covering of the mound, but also more generally the whole tradition of burial that this represents because this, is, this, is, this is one grave is part of a longer tradition and a larger tradition of, of burial that, that lasts for a certain period of time. So it has all these different ways of, of looking at the temporality of this, this one object, or, or this one site. 
Now, because different objects themselves have different ages, even if they're interred together, there remains a sense in which, therefore, the notion of a closed find is something of a fiction. If we ask the simple question, how old is this grave, uh, it actually has a lot of answers depending on what we mean by that. Are we dating it, of course, by the act of deposition or interment or covering of the mound, or we de do we date it by the fines associated with the deceased, all of which will have slightly different dates depending on their age, or are we talking about the date of the tradition of the burial itself, are we talking about a, a, a burial that was done at the end of this period of tradition of building, or the beginning, or the middle? How long do we stretch back these connections to the past? Now, in some ways, of course, archaeologists uh, have been aware of a lot of these issues long before Olivia pointed them out in his article. One of the basic rules of dating that archaeologists use is that of TPQ, the terminus post quem, the date after which the deposit might have been formed. So even with a so-called closed context like the grave, which might have objects dated to different periods, we always, of course, take the youngest date as the TPQ, and then that becomes the de facto date here. But I guess Olivia's point really is not so much acknowledging that this is something we've always done, but why do we do that? Why are we striving to put one date on this grave in the first place? Why are we thinking that it just belongs to one particular moment in the past? Why, don't, why aren't we kind of accepting the fact that perhaps it contains multiple temporalities in it? So in a sense, the answer really depends on what we're interested in. Are we act, interested just in the act of interment, that kind of moment in the past that this grave represents, or are you interested in the general style of the burial and what this represents and its connection to the wider cultural practices? And in a sense, for Olivia, it's the second question that's more interesting, but it's also this second question that then we suddenly have to deal with this issue of multiple temporalities. It's also much easier to understand why you get these discrepancies in the dating through dendrochronology uh, and, and, uh, and the dating provided by the traditional methods of cross-dating. Perhaps this discrepancy isn't about which one is right and which one is wrong. They're actually telling us very different things about the temporality of the grave. So no amount of better data will necessarily resolve this problem. Of course, we can refine the dating of when this event happened of the burial but that's not all that's at stake here. The very elasticity in the temporalities of the different objects and practices means that such correspondence is unlikely to ever be found, especially at resolutions of less than a century. And again, this is not a dating issue. This is about the inherent temporality of these things gathered together. Moreover, for Laurent Olivier, the very variability of these temporalities is something we should be foregrounding and not trying to overcome and regulate into a singular chronology. Now, Olivier has gone on to develop these ideas into a different vision for what archaeology should be. I don't know how many of you are familiar with his work, but I'll discuss it a little bit, certainly later on. But I just want to tie this back to my previous discussion on contemporaneity. All these objects found in the Hochdorf grave are contemporary in the sense, of course, that they coexist. But as we just saw, this is an overlapping contemporaneity, not a synchronicity. Each object or element of the grave had its own life before and so was entangled in a different set of temporal relationships. Another way of framing the problem Olivia discussed regarding this discrepancy between dendrochronology and the traditional cross-dating is to suggest that archaeologists were too fixated on seeing contemporaneity as if it was synchronicity instead of being more attuned to the diverse forms of contemporaneity evident in the princely grave. Now, I think what gives this example that Olivia chose its force is, in a sense, precisely the illusion of a tight chronological resolution. And here I'm going to uh, reproduce a, a graph I showed last night, but with a different title and slightly different uh, scaling. Both in terms of the sequence of events represented and the dating of these events, if I can recall the example from last night of the Boxgrove's talk, which Colleen also mentioned, as this Paleolithic site in southern England, there we had a case of very high resolution in terms of the events, evident flint napping episodes of maybe 15 minutes, set in a very coarse resolution of dating, about 46,000 years. And I use Christian Simonetti's, the anthropologist Simonetti's analogies of digital and optical resolution to characterize the difference between these two things where Bockgrove offers us a very high digital resolution but extremely low optical one. Now, with the Hochdorf grave, taking those same ideas, we also have a quite high digital resolution. The grave is well preserved. It's a kind of almost frozen moment in time, again, with all the caveats around that, that phrase. Um, 
the grave, ex for example, took, took several weeks to, to, actually, uh, to actually be covered over in the estimate of the excavators. But we also have this fairly high optical resolution based on the various datings of the burials being placed within a half-century window of the late 6th century BC. And as I said, probably since Olivia's original paper, it, the dating might have even been refined even more tighter now through, through, uh, through um, further research. But Olivia's point, of course, is that even with this close dating, the temporality of the grave still exceeds those boundaries when looked at from a plural perspective. So what do we do, though, in cases where we don't have good dig digital resolution? Both the box grove example I gave last night and the hot dog grave both have good dig digital resolution, following that analogy. Um, but what about cases where that digital resolution isn't good, even if we've got quite good optical resolution? I think, in fact, this is actually rather common. Those open contexts I mentioned earlier, like settlement layers, as opposed to the so-called closed context of a grave, entrain a very different set of problems than those Olivia addresses. Now, Olivia's distinction, or criticism, rather, of the distinction between open and closed contexts is, is I think, somewhat selective in its focus. It tends to be very oriented mostly on the formation of the, of the grave as a kind of artifactual assemblage. Uh, and in that sense, of course, it's fine. And Olivier is primarily thinking of his grave as if it was a once living system where different objects will come together at different times and bring different histories with them. But any archaeological site isn't just composed of artifacts and assemblages, it's also composed of deposits. Uh, and this tension between deposits and assemblages, particularly the speed or tempo with which deposits form and assemblages form, is really quite critical to thinking through uh, how this issue becomes even more complicated in, in these other types of sites and other types of contexts. Olivia does discuss deposits in his study of the grave, but these are treated, in a sense, as part of the assemblage formation of the grave as a whole. Deposits sealing the chamber and the mound construction, for example, are treated in the same way as artifacts deposited in the chamber. This is a live action rerun of a whole sequence from start to finish. What's missing from Olivia's discussion is this tension between the different temporalities of deposit and assemblage formation and a completely different set of problems raised by this. Now, his account doesn't necessarily contradict or preclude these kind of considerations. It really just isn't his main focus. So to broaden this, this issue that I want to raise, particularly between deposit and assemblage formation, I want to turn to the theory of time perspectivism, which raises this question in, in, a, in an even more problematic way. Time perspectivism is, is, a, is a kind of theory or school of thought which emerged in archaeology in the 1980s. Uh, it's mainly connected to the writings of Jeff Bailey, um, though it also uh, drew a lot of inspiration and, and came out of similar discussions in North America at the same time around formation theory, and again, particularly through the, 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 the discussions between, or arguments between Lewis Binford and, and, and Michael Schiffer. Um, particularly as they revolved around this notion of the Pompeii premise, which I also touched on last night. Now, the Pompeii premise, as I mentioned earlier, was uh, the other night, is involved assuming that an archaeological site represents a kind of frozen moment in time, as if all the people are just up and left, leaving things much as they were when they're in use. Now, the whole point of this premise is that it doesn't apply in most cases. Even though most sites might have their Pompeii moments, they don't actually exhibit all the properties of, of this kind of Pompeii, even Pompeii itself, again, as I talked about. Now, Boxgrove is, 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 is arguably a, a Pompeii-type site, and so is the Hochdorf grave, uh, but only to an extent. And the reason we can think of them like that is because, as I also, as I mentioned last night, they were rapidly covered, preventing subsequent disturbance, in the one case by volcanic ash, in the other by a freak landslide, Boxgrove, and in the case of the grave, by deliberate burial and, 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 and sealing. Now, most archaeological sites don't actually exhibit this quality. There is accumulation of continuous activity, each event partially or wholly erasing traces of earlier events. So when a site is eventually abandoned, it may be gradually so, and even then remain exposed to the disturbance by human and non-human agents. And again, this is not to say that a lot of sites, or most sites, won't have some features that exhibit this kind of Pompeii-like quality. A simple post hole is a feature made in a very short period of time, and it can still preserve its integrity and give you a sense of that moment in the past. But when you have a series of post holes, 
each dug at different times, it can be very hard to know how, which came first and how you relate them to each other, if at all. So it's this quality, really, which uh, encouraged Jeff Bailey to think of archaeological sites as palimpsests. This is a term which has been used by archaeologists before, especially to describe the landscape. Landscape archaeologists like Crawford and so in the 1920s talked about the landscape as a palimpsest, but they were using that term in a very, very different sense to the discussions from the 1980s. Um, a palimpsest, of course, is literally a manuscript upon which earlier traces of writing have been partially preserved but, but rubbed over and written over and, and, and replaced and superimposed. Um, and it's a nice analogy, in a sense, for the archaeological record, except it does till, still tend to preserve a certain sense of stratigraphy, of sequential layering, albeit disturbed and obscured. But an archaeological palimpsest, especially as evoked by time perspectivism, often involves very different processes to that observed on a piece of parchment. Here I put up Bailey's uh, five types of uh, palimpsest, which he discusses in a very interesting paper from the 2007. But what's interesting is that uh, most of these don't actually really mimic a palimpsest as all, at all in, in, terms of, in terms of what we understand it. In a sense, a palimpsest is like the different events happening while the parchment's still being made. It's not like raising and covering over a, a given fixed background. And this, of course, doesn't make any sense, which is why the palimpsest analogy, although useful as a quick, quick way of thinking about the problem, on closer analogy, doesn't really hold water. A better analogy would be something like fresco painting, where, where, the, where, where the painting has been done while the plaster is still wet, but stays wet for a long time, so you can constantly modify and change the picture. But really, none of these analogies do, do it quite justice, and they, they in a sense, perhaps distort slightly what, what we were dealing with as archaeologists in this concept of, of, uh, of, um, of the palimpsest. So the best way, perhaps, is just to dive into the archaeology and think, think it through through an archaeological example. So let's just think of a very slow-forming cumulative deposit, like a midden or even a floor layer composed of half ashes, half ashes which are periodically replenished. Now think of the artifacts that end up in that midden or floor layer of course, they represent multiple different episodes of duration uh, and very different episodes to the duration of the deposit itself. So you might have the remains of a feast here, the remains of everyday dining there, all being parceled up into a single excavated deposit. Now, of course, we've developed techniques for trying to break down the, the detail of some of this layering, which we can't always see with the aqueduct eye. The use of micromorphology and microstratigraphy can enable us to distinguish layers which we can't see uh, when we're excavating. But in practical terms, a lot of the deposits we excavate are really aggregates and bundles of activities compressed together into a single deposit. And this is because while the deposit's forming, ob ob objects from activities and traces of activities are being incorporated into it as it's, as it's building up and following. And there's no real sense of the preservation of these activities being preserved in the deposit itself, and no ha chance of, of uh, dissecting them, pulling them apart. As a result, the data recovered from most deposits are what we call time averaged. Time averaging was a, is a concept developed actually in paleontology to talk about the time average nature of geological deposits and the fossils contained within them. And it was used a lot by archaeologists, particularly working in paleolithic sediments and so on. But in a sense, time averaging occurs on, 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 on all kinds of sites, on all archaeological sites, and it's something that we have to deal with all the time. They're simply aggregates of multiple individual events they have what we call a rather poor digital resolution. If I refer back to the site that I was talking about last night, my site in Iceland, uh, even though I had quite good optical resolution, I was getting down to, to decades levels and talking about 30-year time spans, I still had floor layers, which I could only date within a 30-year period, and these floor layers were composed and had objects and artifacts from multiple events that took place within that 30-year span, and there's no way for me to pull them apart at all. Um, they still remain aggregates of, of a whole series of much smaller events that took place. Now, this could be a problem. If I just think, uh, think of a hypothetical example, just say, for example, I've got in my room um, from my 30-year period of occupation deposits on this floor, I've got a ceramic assemblage composed of maybe 
uh, cooking pots and 50% tablewares. I could suggest, okay, they were both cooking and, and, and eating in this room. I'm using a really coarse analogy here just to make a point. But the thing is, of course, that's one interpretation here. Another possibility is that for the, first, for the first 15 years, this room was a kitchen, and those cooking pots were associated with the kitchen. And then for the second 15 years, it was used as a dining room, and the tablewares were used for dining. I've actually got no way of knowing which of those scenarios is right. Or maybe endless permutations thereof. Could have been a dining room, kitchen, changed back again, vice versa. Could have changed in any particular ways. Because I can't break down that 30-year block, um, it really uh, makes a difference how I'm going to interpret the activities that went on in that room. There's actually no way around that problem at all. Um, and of course, even though it's a hypothetical example, uh, I think it's a problem that we face all the time. Now, of course, there are lots of things that we can do to think about uh, the way artifacts end up in rooms in terms of the quantities and so on. And, 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 uh, and there's a lot of work done in formation theory that looks at things like the use life of objects and so on, and the impact this has on the ratios and statistics. So, you know the equality or the ratio of cooking pots to, to tablewares has lots of other factors to take into account. You know, maybe tablewares are far more common than cooking pots. I know I have far more plates and cups than I do saucepans in my house, so that doesn't mean um, uh, anything about the kind of, it doesn't have any temporal implications there. But all that aside, it doesn't really change the problems here, that we have a, have, have a relatively uh, problematic digital resolution of this site, even though the uh, optical one is quite good. So I, I guess what I've tried to show up here is that we've got, we've got a, a site that, uh, that claims to have relatively high optical resolution. Of course, it's all depending on what, or relative to what you mean. But if you can date your, your site or your feature or your layer to within a 50 or even a 30-year period, like I did in my site from Iceland, that still uh, is, is problematic if your digital resolution isn't any, any better or any more comparable. You, you've still got this problem going on there of how to, uh, how to deal with that. So the issue really isn't about optical resolution dating. It's about the digital resolution, about the, the, the resolution of the set of events that you're trying to explore archaeologically. Now, Boxgrove was an exception in terms, in terms of Paleolithic archaeology. Most Paleolithic sites have very poor digital and poor optical resolution. Uh, and it's in these contexts, no surprise, that time perspectivism, and, and Jeff Bailey particularly, was largely developing and working. This was his field. But I, I would suggest that even in, in later prehistoric and historical archaeology, and certainly where you know, the period that I'm working in, 17th, 18th century, these issues are still relevant and pertinent. They don't just apply to, to, to some of the problems that Paleolithic archaeologists face. It's all relative. I mean, the issue of poor digital resolution still has to be in engaged with. So how do you suggest, how do, how do we get out of this problem? Well, time perspectivism has its own answer, and it's a rather familiar one. We simply enlarge our scale of analysis, because archaeological sites, they argue, rarely give us snapshots of life in action at a scale we experience, but only give us this aggregate patterns, these aggregate data, so we can only attempt any histories or archaeologies on an equally large scale. Now, time perspective, as some of you know, is, is particularly skeptical in any attempts at ethnographic style archaeologies, narratives which attempt to write the past, write about the past as if we had access to a time as it's humanly experienced. They argue that the palimpsest nature of the archaeological record simply does not make this possible in a lot of instances. Now, okay, it sounds okay as an argument, but there's actually even a worse argument to follow because, in a sense, how do we know that the aggregate or time average nature of this data? is really reflecting larger scale processes. Why is just because our data aggregate, does that have to somehow reflect some more larger scale pattern or process? Maybe that aggregation, all that aggregation produces is just noise, not a, not a more larger pattern at all. It's the opposite, like you go, they're, they're claiming that if you're too, too close to the picture, you can't see the paint painting, so you have to stand back and look at it. Um, but maybe it's the opposite way around, that the further you stand back from the picture, the harder it is to see what it is you're looking at. Now, I think it's really useful here to kind of unpick what time averaging implies. And again, part of the problem, perhaps, is thinking about time averaging in the same way as we might think about spatial averaging. So let's just say, for example, I'm doing a, a sociology of... Um, of Glasgow and want to know about how many books each household has. I can go around and do an inventory and, and, and do a count of how many books are, are, are there and uh, from that produce a statistical data set. 
Now, what time perspectivism would seem to be suggesting is that I only have access to this larger scale data set, this statistical aggregate. I don't have the original inventories. Um, I can't tie them back to any particular households. Now, put like that, of course, it sounds fine, because if I have the, the aggregate data set, I can still make some generalizations about the reading habits or book ownerships of Glaswegians, I don't, even if I can't relate them back to individual households. But I think, actually, that's a little bit disingenuous, because that's not really what the archaeological palimpsest is implying. It's much more accurate to say, we do have all those inventories, but we just have bits and fragments of them. It's, a, it's as if someone has taken all those inventories and put them through a shredder and then just randomly picked out some of these pieces and put them together. And it's those which we then create our aggregate data. Now, what's the guarantee that they'll produce any patterning at all? Well, maybe nothing. That's the problem. And the difference is, because time averaging involves time, we have to consider the effect, in a sense, of entropy on aggregation. Why should aggregation lead to larger scale patterning as opposed to just simply entropy or noise? This is, of course, just an assumption. But if we put it like this, the, in a sense, the unintended implications of time perspectivism actually seem far more gloomy than they'd paint themselves. It leads to the conclusion that the archaeological record is just noise. And yet, of course, we know it isn't. We do pull out patterns. We do find, manage to make a great deal of sense of this record. All our experience actually tells us that, there's, that, that what, what time perspectivism is saying is just isn't really true. Of course, there are cases where it's very harder, very difficult to, to, uh, to, to see patterns. And I've no doubt there are cases when the archaeological record is just noise. But I don't think that's the case in, in most instances. And the reason, I think, is really straightforward. Because even if we can't disentangle all those events uh, from our palimpsest, even if we've got this deposit which lasted over 30 years, and in, in, in it are bits and pieces of residues of multiple different activities, which are all mangled together in one big group, there's still a pattern that emerges. And the reason is quite simple. People and humans, um, are, uh, they, ha they have habits. They, they kind of perform routinized behavior. They do the same things over and over. Of course, there's differences and variations. But this is the whole point, of course, about practice theory and our understanding of human social behavior. That would be, a lot of our actions are repetitive. And it's this repetitive element that essentially enables us to dissect and pull out these patterns. So in a sense, we've gone all the way back and used all the arguments of time perspectivism against themselves to suggest actually, yes, maybe we do deal with aggregate data, but these aggregate data have patterns which do reflect back on those micro-events which time perspectivism says we can't see. Now, none of this is to deny that there's ambiguities, that there'll be bits of, bits of the p p p picture missing and so on. Uh, and certainly, no one's going to ever claim that archaeologists will be paleoethnographers, but it doesn't mean we can't understand the archaeological record at these kind of uh, uh, human scales or, or, or human... Uh, levels of analysis, or indeed historical ones. So at this point, I want to return back to Laurent Olivier and his work, because in a way, his solution to that dilemma of kind of multiple temporalities evident in the archaeological record is, is far more appealing to me. Although he too, of course, sometimes evokes the language of scale, on the whole, he characterizes the matter in very non-scalar terms. For Olivia, the palimpsest is not really a problem, one that, that points to the to low temporal resolution and so the need for larger scales of analysis, but rather the palimpsest is the very condition or possibility of archaeology in the first place. And for him, it points to a view that archaeological time is much more uh, like in a form of memory than like history. I'm going to try and explain what he's talking about here. So memory, as probably many of you know, became a very hot topic in archaeology in the late 90s. A lot of the topics I've been talking about became very hot in the late 1990s and still are uh, to some extent. But Olivia's discussion of memory is not really part of this mainstream discussion of, of memory, which mostly addresses questions of uh, collective and social memory in the past. Uh, and the, the particularly intellectual ancestor of these kind of memory studies is Maurice Halbach's. Now, Olivia's discussions of memory are rather take inspiration from another mentor, uh, actually Halbach's former and repudiated teacher, Henry Bergson. Halbach studied under Bergson, but later disagreed with his views and went on to follow a Durkheimian path to study memory. But it's Bergson's views on memory which became much more influential. Um, and particularly, 
inspired Olivier to think about the archaeological record as what he calls some kind of polychronic ensemble. I'll talk about what this, this phrase means in a little bit. But it's basically this idea that things are mixed from different times and with different life histories, even though they all coexist here and now. Now, Olivia has drawn out these ideas uh, in detail in his book, The Dark Abyss of Time, the original French version of which came out about nine years after his, uh, his paper on the grave. But this idea of kind of polychronic assemblers is, is really straightforward. I mean, it's just, if you walk down any town or city today, and it's a bit like the example I gave about the objects in your house, with ceiling objects from whole different time periods. You can see shop fronts from, from, the, from the early 2000s with houses going back to the 18th century, uh, maybe even features of, 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 of Roman remains in some cases. So any kind of uh, modern-day contemporary landscape has remains and traces of, of all kinds of pasts caught up in its present today. Now, this, of course, is something, yes, we all recognize this and accept this, but Olivia's point, I suppose, is that as archaeologists, our drive is to kind of somehow purify and segregate all these elements together and pull them apart and say, okay, that bit's Roman, that bit's Anglo-Saxon, this bit is medieval, this is 19th century, and we push them all apart. And in doing so, we kind of ignore the relationship they all have to each other. Um, and more importantly, understand the fact that they all coexist in the same time we, in a sense, kind of purify them and separate them and say, this belongs to that time, that belongs to that time, and so on, and we push them apart. And Olivia's argument is that we should actually try and keep them together. In a sense, it's another way of, of, of articulating the, 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 uh, the nature of the archaeological record as a contemporary phenomenon. Uh, again, Olivia didn't, didn't uh, invent this phrase. In fact, Lewis Binford talked about the archaeological record as a contemporary phenomenon back in the 1980s. But his use of that term was really more in terms of an epistemological argument and is linked to his ideas of middle range theory and so on, and also the Pompeii premise. But for Olivia, the idea of the archaeological record as a contemporary phenomenon is much more of an ontological statement than an epistemological one. It's one also he shares with, for example, Michael Shanks, when he says, we don't work with the past, we work on what remains with the past. Now, again, you can take these statements in Binfordian terms as a reminder to conduct proper source criticism and so on, but that's not what Shanks or Olivia is saying. They're arguing, really, there's this very quality of remaining, of persisting, of the past persisting in the present that should really occupy our attention. What is it about the past that still lingers in the present? And how might we situate archaeology within this question? Because this really, in a sense, and what, certainly what Olivia is suggesting is that we reframe our whole goals of archaeology, which isn't about kind of uncovering the past in terms of a linear trajectory of A followed B followed C, blah, 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 but it's really about thinking about the archaeological record as a coexisting thing in the present and what it, what it is to explore the multiple temporalities of the past in the present. Now, in a sense, this is a very interesting way of looking at it, and I'm going to come back to it at the end about what I think of it. But I think it's important perhaps to remind ourselves that this notion, although it might seem a bit strange to us, is perhaps not that strange at all if we look back at our own disciplinary history. Um, I think it's an issue that we've kind of forgotten about, but actually it was an issue which engaged a lot of uh, early archaeologists and antiquarians, and they thought about the archaeological record in very similar terms. Um, and I think it becomes very clear when we think about how the language was used to talk about the archaeological record, for example, in the 19th century. Now, a lot of words have been used to talk about the archaeological record. I talk about the archaeological record all the time, but we also use other phrases like remains and ruins and relics and traces and fragments. And all these have slightly different connotations and, and carry different implications for our ontological understanding of what that record is. And the list could go on. But some of these words, of course, have a very antiquarian ring to them. We don't talk about vestiges so much, or even relics, because perhaps they also carry other connotations. But I think what's striking about some of these antiquarian terms, like relics and vestiges, is that they um, uh, foreground an aspect of the archaeological record that was perhaps of great concern in the 19th century, but one which, as I said, we've perhaps forgotten today. What characterizes the notion of a vestige or a relic, in a sense, is its untimeliness. That is, they're from another era. They're anachronisms or survivals. And this is not a coincidence that this, this connection is there. I'm not being quite, uh, I'm not slipping away with the language here. 
Because if you read some of the texts about, uh, from late 19th century anthropologists and archaeologists talking about relics and, 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 and survivals, they're, they're often expressed in very much the same language. The very word antiquity was used, or antiquities, was used to refer not only to archaeological remains and relics, it was also used to refer to customs and ways of life which are still surviving in the present but have kind of outlived their usefulness. They were kind of survivals from an earlier, earlier era, but that they're still around together. So, so this kind of uh, continuity in the word antiquity and, and in the phrase relic and survivals was very, very prevalent and kind of underlined a sense of something about the past persisting in the present. Uh, of a kind of contemporary past. I think, and this comes out perhaps particularly clearly with anthropologist um, Edward Tyler's work, uh, because he quite explicitly, when he talks about trying to understand the human past, he, he, he quite explicitly puts up relics and survivals as essentially the two methods in which anthropologists and archaeologists can explore the past. These are the two routes to the past. One is looking at survivals in the present, ethnographic survivals, um, and archaeological remains or antiquities. And these are put on a par. And it's their status, in a sense, as anachronisms and survivals that makes and forms the very possibility of studying the past. Now, the idea of relics being anachronisms might sound simply strange or quaint to us today, but it does have a darker side, of course, especially if we remember that the idea of anachronism worked not just about archaeological remains and relics, but also on these ethnographic concepts of survivals. The crux of the notion of an anachronism refers, of course, to an object or custom or way of thought which is out of its proper time. And no doubt, archaeology itself helped to create this perceived uh, temporal order for things and, and helped to define what it is that something should be in its proper time. Uh, and this, of course, is just more part of a larger legacy of modernist thinking, where the tropes of modernity have defined the very possibility of something being untimely in the first place. So what, but what makes something untimely is an idea of contemporaneity, which works off the notion of the present as an era or period. So for the 19th century uh, uh, antiquarians, archaeological remains were non-contemporary because they did not belong to the present, the modern, the modern era. The present is distinct from the past, or the modern is distinct from the ancient or pre-modern. And these are very classic, what you might say, the chronoschisms of modernity, this kind of splitting of time into two. And some of you may be aware, of course, of the, of the famous book by the anthropologist Johannes Fabian, his book Time in the Other, which explores exactly these kinds of issues, and, and particularly the way anthropology used time to create a distance between itself and its object, the people it studied. So anthropologists in the 19th and early 20th century um, clearly coexisted with the people they were studying, whether it was indigenous uh, Australians or the Trebian Islands or whatever. Yet when they wrote about them, they wrote as if they lived in a different time to the anthropologists. So at its height, contemporary peoples around the world were described as if they were still living in the Stone Age or in the distant past, an era long before modernity. Sometimes scholars were even very explicit about this era, conjuring up the idea of a Paleolithic or Neolithic society still alive today. Um, and that's, of course, very evident in, in, uh, in Solos' book, Ancient Hunters, which was, which was uh, uh, using this notion of survivals uh, to put flesh on the dry bones of archaeology. Now, Fabian famously called, uh, called this assumption the denial of coevalness. That is, the, the experience of doing, between the experience of doing the field work and then writing up about the people you were studying, anthropologists inserted a temporal fracture or break between themselves and the people they studied engendering the sense that the present was, in fact, not singular but split into two, and they invented a new term for this other present which their subjects lived in, the ethnographic present, which is very dis distinct from the anthropologist's present. Now, you might think this is just history. We've got past these Victorian prejudices, and perhaps in the case of most academic disciplines, this is true, but I think it still lingers on, even in, in some fields, and I hope there's no economist here in the audience today, but my feeling is that a lot of economics is, is very conservative on this issue, and still, in its language of development and underdevelopment and so on, still kind of clings to some of these old ideas. Um, so the language of an anachronism still haunts also much of popular culture, just think, of example, how often the terms medieval or prehistoric are used to describe something as backward. Uh, and I just want to point out a, 
an advert that's going around in Iceland at the moment from a, a, a mobile phone company. It says, don't be a dinosaur. I, I very much feel like a dinosaur when it looks at this company. But it is, it's drawing on exactly the same language and same tropes that Fabian's talking about, this idea that that uh, the past is somehow backward, undeveloped, and so on, and, and that, that if you are not with this mobile company, you're living in a different time to the rest of us. You're not up to date. It's the same things going on here. So although the idea of thinking about how the past lingers on to the present was central to the birth of archaeology and anthropology, because this lingering was framed in terms of this progressive evolutionary narrative, it resulted in, a, in what you might call a bifurcation or splitting of the present. Uh, into a or of a contemporaneity into two kinds of present, modernity and non-modernity, the, the anthropological present and the ethnograph sorry, the anthropologist's present and the ethnographic present. Now, scholarly reactions to this evolutionary narrative in the 20th century have more or less removed the moralistic connotations of this bifurcation. But I think the bifurcation itself is still there, although now instead of composed of two presents, it's simply one present and one past. The presence of the past in the present was no longer considered an issue, except methodologically. So again, we come back to Livia's point, this need to kind of purify any contemporary context and separate this into Rome and this into Anglo-Saxon, this into 19th century when you're walking around a town today. It's that same sense of trying to separate out the present into all its different components, as if they're not all contemporary and belonging together. It's, it's denying the contemporaneity of, of a Roman building with a 20th century um, shop, because they are contemporary. So how might we recapture this original acknowledgement of the presence of the past uh, in the present without reverting to the language of 19th century anachronism and all the problems that entails? Now, Olivia's discussion of archaeology as a memory practice is one way, and it's been drawn along a lot by other archaeologists like uh, Chris Whitmore, for example, and Alfredo uh, gonzalez Rubal, who both talked about the persistence of older ways of doing things. And both, for example, have suggested that the Neolithic, which we think of as something in the past, is still existing here, now in the present. Now, at first blush, when you hear these kind of comments, they do sound a bit like these old 19th century accounts. What do they mean the Neolithic is still here? Are they being kind of derogatory to, to other people and saying that they're living in the past? But their purpose actually is exactly the opposite. Rather than talk about kind of uh, notions of progress and so on, it's really intended to disrupt any notion of, of modernity at all and really argue that we've never been modern, uh, we've never been modern, to paraphrase Latour. Uh, and there's a great book by the historian... Um, uh, David Edgerton called The Shock of the Old. I don't know if some of you read it, but he makes a very, lot of very similar points that the past and what we think of as old-fashioned and past is, is still very much alive and kicking in the present. So what all these archaeologists are saying, along with Olivia, is that the present is replete with past, and it's precisely this mixing and folding together of objects and practices from various early times that should hold our attention. They stress the need to uh, any urge to purify and separate these pasts into their separate periods, but rather emphasize and embrace their coexistence. Now, I just want to briefly end, because I'm already going over time, I realize that, and, and, and just summarize what I, my feelings about some of these discussions, because on, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit split and torn, a bit like the present. I find myself both drawn to and yet dissatisfied by uh, these arguments. On the one hand, uh, I find a great value in keeping hold of the idea of an archaeological record as, as, a, as what you might say this polychronic ensemble uh, of something that's composed of multiple different times and, and pasts, especially in thinking about how the different forms of time it might hold beyond the singular or segmented time implicit in chronology. So at the top, we've got this kind of classic view where everything is apportioned and given, put into its proper time slot. Uh, and then on the, um, on the left, you've got Olivia's rendition of how, this, how, how he views this, where the past and present are, are seen in a kind of recursive relationship, where the past is constantly being erupted back into the present, and the present is being buried and sent to the past and then followed around. Now, of course, there are problems with the traditional approach, but uh, I think what I find more problematic is the way uh, Olivia's approach, for example, is, is devaluing a lot of the important aspects of historicity, in a sense, which the, which the traditional approach at least tries to deal with. Uh, and I think it seems to me that uh, 
One of the problems with Olivia is that if we overemphasize the persistence of the past and the present, we end up almost kind of collapsing the present of the past into the present. So it is just the present we're dealing with, and we're no longer addressing a historical narrative. And maybe, of course, that's fine. If that's what you want to do with your archaeology, uh, maybe that's, that is fine. But for me, I guess I still, perhaps I'm a little bit of a traditionalist at heart, I still believe that archaeology is partly a historical discipline. Its interest is in understanding the historicity of things. So how do we deal with that without reverting back to the traditional model? I've just thrown up this graph on the right because it, it came from my book on time in 2005, and I don't really want to go into it in any detail, but it's really this thinking about time in a way which is kind of faithful to this notion of polychronic ensembles, the idea of the past persisting into the present, but doesn't kind of need to separate and purify all those pasts, that we can think about the past as continuing into the present in other ways that don't force us to be kind of forever trapped in the present, but to acknowledge this constant tension. Let me just end with one, one perhaps clearer example to illustrate one of the ways in which this work might, might come through. And here I just want to reference the work of some of Olivia's, uh, Olivia's colleagues in France working in the field of archaeogeography. I don't know, some of you may be familiar with this, with this school of thought. But it's... Um, it's a basically a, a landscape school of archaeology in, in, in France, which is very much focused on this notion of how we can understand the archaeological record in terms of the persistence of the past into the present, um, uh, uh, rather than just always be dividing things up into time blocks. So the classic example is by one of the founders of this movement, Gérard Schuka, who looked at this process of uh, landscape layout in terms of fields and the effect of Roman centuriation, this division of fields in the Roman period, and its impact and persistence in present-day landscapes. So here's an example of a 19th century map from Italy which shows the, the centuriation of, of the landscape still very much present more than 1,000 years later and how it still has something that is Roman. It's still having an active and an agentive role 1,000 years later. It isn't just something from... Uh, the fourth century, it's something that's actually still active in the 19th century. So we can't just call it Roman is misleading. It's as much 19th century as it is Roman. And of course, we can see this all around. I mean, you don't have to look far to think of other examples. And I've just thrown up Avery as a really cheesy and obvious example of this, how you've got an impact of a, of a very old prehistoric monument and its impact on, 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 a, on, a, later, on a later village structures and so on. And so the choice between an archaeology which would somehow mimic history and one which would constitute a memory practice is perhaps a false choice, which is the kind of choice that Olivia presents us with. And I'd rather see history in a much richer way than this. And this notion of a, of a braided rope, which I talked about earlier, is one such way. But there's lots of different ways of thinking about the multiplicity of time and the way that the past persists in the present without having to necessarily fall back to the traditional trope of, of these segments and, the, and these periods. So I think uh, this is really a challenge for us to really to think about how, how we can deal with these polychronic ensembles in, in a more sophisticated way. But I, I, I'm going to stop now because I think the time is up. Thank you. <laughs>